Good morning. You guys can take a seat. It's so good to be with you. Before we do anything, we just got to take a moment and honor our pastors, Pastor Dustin and Jamie Bates. They are incredible. They're getting some well-deserved rest. And um, man, before I even jump into the word, I just feel the need to honor them. Uh, I, I've admired them from, from afar for a while, uh, which sounds creepy, but it's true. Uh, even when I was, wasn't even living in Texas, I've just been thankful for their leadership. And, you know, from a distance, it's easy to admire people who are gifted from a distance, and they are gifted, some of the greatest uh, leaders and preachers. But then you get up close and you see that they actually are who they say they are, that they're kind and that they love people. And so I'm so deeply thankful uh, for Pastor Dustin Bates and Pastor to Jamie. One more time, can we honor them? We're so thankful for the leadership. And um, as he said, I've been preaching like a madman. I've been in, in Hawaii. I uh, preached like basically every day for like two weeks. Someone's got to go. You know what I mean? Someone, so I'm basically a missionary, but someone's got to go to the islands and, and suffer. And uh, I haven't told pastor this, but I think every three months, I'm just going to go on a quick tour and, uh, and minister to the people there. Um, I've, I've got some, I've got some bad news and I've got some good news for you today. The bad news is our guest speaker this morning was supposed to be Pastor Chris Estrada. And and his flight got canceled, and so some of you came just to hear him. And now you're wondering why this 90-pound teenager has the microphone, and you're just curious. And you're plotting your escape. You are. I can see it on some of your faces. You're plotting your escape. And if you're an experienced Christian, then you're waiting for the moment where I pray over the service, and that's the moment when you slip out. Well, guess what? I'm not even going to pray over the... You're just, you're just stuck in here. <laughs> just gonna have to, we're just going to have to go through it. Bad news is I found out last night at 11 p.m. That I, that I was preaching and that I'm running on like three hours of sleep. <laughs> the good news is in my weakness, God's strength is made perfect. The good news is it's not about me anyway. The good news is the anointing of the Holy Spirit is all we need anyway. And so I got a word for you today. And, uh, and as soon as I figure out what that is, we'll get started. But um, no, I do have a word for you, for you today. And I, I believe God's going to touch your life. I, I, I fully believe this, that God's going to set some people free today. Um, that there, maybe you're in this place and you've been carrying things your whole life mindsets you've had your whole life, cycles you've had your whole life to where you've just made up in your mind that this is normal. This is going to be a part of my life forever. And I'm believing that today God in his kindness, in his love, in his mercy is just going to interrupt that cycle and bring you freedom unexpectedly. You know, last night uh, God reminded me uh, of a story. Can I just build your faith before we jump into the word? God reminded me of a story um, a couple years ago I was preaching. And uh, I believe God still speaks. Anybody else believe that God still speaks to us? And uh, so it was at the end of service, it was a youth conference, and I was just, I was, God was highlighting some people to me, and I was just, you know, calling a few people out and encouraging them. And I don't know about you, but I can sometimes get frustrated by how vague people can be in prophetic meetings. You know what I'm talking about? Like it'll be an auditorium of 10,000 people, and the guy's like, Does somebody have back pain here? And I'm like, Most of us have back pain. <laughs> Back pain here, you know. And so I was sharing some words, and, and I just, I was a little bit frustrated because I was just like, God, I think I'm hearing the voice of God, and I think this is encouraging. I think it's good, but it's, it's kind of like, you know, it's like I'm hearing Jeremiah 29, 11. God has plans for you, not to, pro, to prosper you, not to harm you. And that's good, but it's like that could be applicable to anybody, you know. And so, and so I'm praying, God, give me something deeper. God, give me a, a specific word. And God's like, you want specific? And I'm like, yes, God, I want something specific. And he's like, cool. There's a girl who's in this room who has been harming herself. She's been cutting her right shoulder and has scars on her arm. Pray for her. I want to take her scars away. I was like, Jeremiah 29 11 is a good verse. I could, <laughs> I could share that one. It would be powerful. And uh, so I'm wrestling with God and I'm, I'm wrestling with my flesh. And, and after a while, I, I just kind of step out of the boat and I just say, hey, I, I believe that there's someone here you've been harming yourself. Jesus wants to know that, she, that he loves you and he wants to take your scars away. 
And, and so I share this word, and I'm not going to call this young lady forward. I'm not going to embarrass her. And I just I pray. I close out the service. I walk to the back of the auditorium, and there's this girl who comes up to me with tears in her eyes. She said, I had scars on my right shoulder. You prayed that word, and they are gone. And I, did you know God still heals? Did you, come on. Do you know God still heals? The thing that she thought she was going to have for the rest of her life. The thing that she thought she was going to carry with her to her grave in a moment. God can take those things and heal us of those, of those things. And I think that this morning there's things that we've been carrying. There's things that we've called normal that are a part of our lives. And God is here in his love and in his mercy to surprise you with his goodness and remove that thing that has been plaguing you. Can we pray right now with all faith, God, we thank you in the name of Jesus that you are here. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. In Jesus' name, come and do whatever you want to do. Open up our hearts to receive your word. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. That was your moment for escape. Everyone's still here. Let's go. Are you ready for the word? Let's jump in. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 through 20 is where we're going to be. Paul is writing to the church of Corinth. Corinthians were messed up, man. You ever read the Bible? There's some drama going up in there. But he shares this encouraging word with them. He says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? This is the part I want to highlight. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Not just a word for the Corinthians today, but here at Church 1132, you are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. This morning, I want to preach a message to you entitled, Not for Sale. Everyone say, I'm not for sale. Not for sale. Touch the person next to you. Say, don't live for sale. That was weak and pathetic. Bump the person next to you and say, I'm not for sale. I've been yelling at youth for two weeks in a row, so if I come a little heavy-handed, just forgive me. And also, you know, Pastor Dustin will be back, so just if you're a guest with us. It's crazy to me, in this day and age, it seems like money can buy everything. I was studying for this message, and I learned that if you are in prison, and I hope you never are, but you can, uh, you can upgrade your jail cell for $90 a night. It's a pretty good deal, I think. Money can buy almost Almost anything. I was reading last night about this thing called skinvertising. People will turn themselves into human billboards and tattoo websites or logos on their skin for monetary gain. I heard about a story of a lady who auctioned off her forehead, y'all. We, we can sell foreheads in 2021. She auctioned off her forehead. Someone put their website on it for $10,000. It seems like money can buy almost anything, and it seems like our culture is trying to purchase our attention, purchase the way that you think. They're throwing dollars at your worldview, and it seems like everything is for sale, but our confession of faith this morning is, I'm not for sale. My passion for Jesus is not for sale. My yes to Jesus is not for sale. My calling is not for sale. And this morning we're going to talk about one of the greatest sellouts in all of human history. His name is Judas Iscariot. Now, if, if, if you're here and you're like, bro, I came on a Sunday morning and you're talking about Judas. I wasn't ready for all of this. I apologize, but I believe God's going to speak through this. If, if you don't know who Judas is, he was one of the 12 disciples that was hand-selected by Jesus. He spent three years alongside Jesus, and Judas um, even healed the sick. He preached the gospel. He cast out demons. Judas did a bunch of ministry alongside Jesus, but even in the midst of all of this ministry, Judas secretly was a thief. He was stealing from the ministry. Even though Judas spent three years alongside Jesus, Judas one day decides to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. The religious leaders had already made up in their minds, the Roman soldiers had already made up in their minds that they were going to crucify Jesus. They just didn't know where to find him. And so Judas sells Jesus' location for 30 pieces of silver. Judas 
leads them to the place where Jesus is. And there's this famous moment where Judas kisses Jesus on the cheek to reveal to the Roman soldiers who he is, who to arrest. They arrest him and they crucify him. Judas then, under the weight of condemnation and shame, tragically ends up ending his own life. How horrible of Judas. How are you going to stab the savior of humanity in the back? Of all people to betray, I would strongly suggest this morning not betraying Jesus. Judas, Judas's name is forever marked as evil. Like, like no one is naming their kid Judas. No girl is, is dating somebody named Judas. Saying he's, his name's Judas, but he's really sweet. I'm fixing him. I'm fixing him. Right. No, no girl is on Tinder seeing a guy named Judas and swiping right. Like, no, no one is. You're not on Tinder anyway, right? It's a, it's a different message for our February series. No one is befriending anybody named, named Judas. I, f- I feel bad because, because there were two disciples named Judas. Did you know this? Jesus had two disciples named Judas. I feel really bad for other Judas. Can you imagine meeting other Judas in heaven? Like you're meeting David and Paul, you're dabbing them up. What's up, David? Paul? I'm a huge fan. And then you meet someone, you're like, I don't recognize you. What's your name? And you can't lie in heaven. It's, it's a rule. And he's like, it's Judas, man. And you're like, cool. How'd you, uh, how'd you get in here? Quick question. How dare you? Like, how do... I feel bad for, bad for other Judas. Like, even throughout the Acts of the Apostles, the other Judas was like, you got, where do you guys want to go out to eat? They're like, shut up, other Judas. You're like, you just, we, don't, we don't like you. Feel bad for other Judas. Judas' name, Judas' scariest name is forever marked, marked as, as evil, and, and rightfully so. We all hate on Judas, rightfully so. But I think that we forget that when we live for sale, we're setting up our lives Maybe to walk out on Jesus the same way that Judas did. And I think God is here in love, in mercy, and in kindness to see those characteristics that exist in us, that may have existed in Judas, lovingly just do surgery and remove them from us so that we can be healed. And I want to talk about two characteristics of Judas' life today that I believe may be in existence in us, and God is on an assignment today to remove the price tags from our life, and from this day forward, we're not going to be for sale. Here's the first thought I want to share with you. Judas was a pretender. You ever met a professional pretender? Anyone see anyone in the, in the room that's a professional pretender? I'm just, don't point him out. A couple of, couple of years ago, I remember this particular moment where my wife, sitting on the front row, um, she, uh, she was receiving a phone call, and I don't know about you, but it's 2021, just text me, you know what I mean? Like, let's not start with a phone call, just text me, and uh, y'all, don't leave me alone on that, anybody else, just text, come on, can we start with a text message? And, and, and so she's receiving this phone call, and she's like, why aren't they texting me? She's like, oh, I don't want to talk on the phone. Oh, why are they calling me? Hello? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's see how long I can do that. No. <laughs> so good, like she can just turn it on. I, I, I remember one time I was a youth pastor, and, uh, and, and students are the best at pretending. They can become anybody, especially at youth camp. They can just become anybody that they want to. And so I walked into this room, and this was, guys, this is the most horrible story of pretending I'd ever experienced. I walked into this room, and I see a circle of my leaders, and they're all whispering and pointing. And, and, and as a youth pastor, you're trained. You know a gossip circle when you see one. So I bust up in there. I'm like, who are you all talking about right now? And they're like, hey, Pastor John, uh, I don't know how to tell you this, but um, one of our students over there, uh, he's pretending to be deaf. <laughs> don't look at me like that. I wasn't the one doing it. This is not my testimony. He was doing it. I said, excuse me, yeah, he's pretending to be deaf. I look over at this kid, and he's got a captive audience of teenage girls. And he's doing sign language to them. And, and they're like, oh, my gosh, this is so sweet. You do sign language. And, 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 I'm the, and first, my first thought was, what's your long-term goal here? 
Like, what if one of them falls for you? You plan on doing this for the rest of your life. But I knew the moment I saw this dude pretending in such a horrible way that it was my God-given destiny, a God-given purpose to expose the mess out of this kid. <laughs> so I'm standing over here. He's standing over there. And uh, I would never tell you this kid's name, but I look over him. I'm like, hey, John. <laughs> and he's doing sign language. I say, hey, John. And he looks over like this. <laughs> yeah. He's not supposed to hear he responds to my voice. And all the girls are like, what? How did you hear him? And he, and he knew in that moment that his pretending had been exposed. He comes over. He just buries his head in my chest. I'm like, it's okay. We're counseling through this. I'm a pastor. It's all right. We're going we're gonna. to. He was a professional pretender. Judas was the best of the best at pretending. In fact, I think if you and I could go back in time and line up the 12 disciples, we would not be able to tell Judas apart from the rest of them. Some of the prophetic moms in this room could. So, some of you discernment moms, you look them in the eyes, you'd be like, that one, he's the betrayer. I can, I can see it all over you. But most of us wouldn't be able to tell the rest of, of, of the disciples apart, contrary to the way that the movies portray it. You know, you watch old movies about the 12 disciples, and there's like 11 of them in white robes, and then there's one in like a dark black robe in the shadows. Just like glaring at everybody. Eleven of them are like worshiping, singing kumbaya. And then, you know, there's one guy in the corner who's got like an ACDC t-shirt on. He's got 666 tattooed on his arm. He's gambling and punching a baby. Like, I wonder which one is Judas. Like, you know, like the, the, the movies would have portrayed this picture that like we would have known. He's got like dark eyeliner on. He's just like, no. Oh. He prayed like them, <laughs> and he worshiped like them, and he stood up and yelled when the preaching got really good like everybody else. He did church really, really good. He, he was a professional at, at pretending, and, and, and my fear for some, it scares me how well church people can pretend. We're the best at it. We could be fighting with our spouse all the way here. And then someone's like, how you doing, brother? And he's like, blessed. <laughs> blessed, blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed in my coming and blessed in my going. <laughs> Don't ask me any more questions. I'm blessed, okay? I'd ask my students, I'd be like, hey, you know, a new student would come. I'd be like, what's, what's your favorite musical artist? They'd be like, Chris Tomlin. <laughs> Casting crowns. It's a, it's a toss-up between those two for me. I don't know, one of those. Like, oh, yeah, what's your favorite movie? The Passion of the Christ, hands down. I love that one. <laughs> not Mel Gibson. He's not a Christian. I only hang out with Christians. Not, I, <laughs> so good at, at pretending, at putting on a church face, and, and, and I'm scared for a generation of people that know how to pray, that know how to praise, not a dance during the fast songs, and worship, lift up our hands during the slow songs, and Judas did all of that. Man, he went to youth camp, he cried at the altar, he wrote his sins down on a sticky note and threw it into a fire. <laughs> Judas did all the Christian things. He wore a purity ring, true love waits. <laughs> Judas did... All of that, man. And, and Jesus says that there's a generation of people who are close to me with their lips but far from me in their hearts. And if I'm preaching straight to you today, I want you to know that this message is not designed to bring condemnation or shame or heaviness. This message is designed to let you know here's the message that God has for you today. You're made for more. You're made, you were bought at a price. So why would we live a life of pretending? You're made for more. And I believe that the world is eagerly waiting for the people of God not to show up as pretenders, not to act like we've got it all together, but to authentically live in this place as sons and daughters of the living God, taking up the authority that we were called to live with. I'm just saying we were made for more. We were called to impact the world. I don't know about you, but I read the scripture and I see what's available to the believer and I say, God, kill every ounce of pretending in me. 
I'm not talking about like necessarily duplistic lifestyles. I'm not necessarily talking about your two-faced and you're completely different. And, and I'm just saying maybe there's small fragments of pretending in you. I remember one time I was in a worship service. And my wife actually, she noticed this. She said, I was looking. She said, I saw this mother worshiping next to her maybe six-year-old son. And she's going in, you know, hands lifted. She's jumping up and down. She's going after this girl that had been in church for a while. And, and her six-year-old son was looking up at her so confused. <laughs> what are you doing, Mom? And that moved me. Because I don't ever want my kids, I don't ever want the people who know me the most to look at me in these environments and say, you're acting different here than you act somewhere else. Man, I'm telling you, I want my kids to look at me worshiping in, in the house of God and say, that's dad. I want them to see me on my face weeping at the altar and say, yep, that's dad. I'm not just praying in the church and shouting in the church, but when I'm in my living room, I'm lifting up the name of Jesus. Come on, if we're gonna have authority, we've gotta be the same inside the church that we are outside of the church. And I believe that the world is waiting for the people of God to show up with authority. Come on, I'm, I'm believing for us to step into a whole new realm as the sons and daughters of God. I see what's available in scripture. Man, and I'm saying until my shadow falls on the sick and they get healed, Jesus, heal the pretending in me. Do you know that's in the word? Until I can look at the tomb where Lazarus was laid and say, come forth. Until blind people start to see. And I still believe in miracles. Until deaf people start to hear. Until lame people start to walk. I'm saying, Jesus, heal the pretending in me. Did you know God wants to use you? But he can't anoint who you pretend to be. And he cannot empower David in Saul's armor. Judas was a pretender. And here's the thing about every pretender is no matter how good you are at it, one day every pretender will have their moment where they're exposed. Judas was at the Last Supper, which I think he was the one who coined that phrase. He walked in there and he's like, man, this is the last time we're all getting together. They're like, what? He's like, nothing. I didn't say anything. So, what are you talking about? Almost blew it. Jesus is at the Last Supper, and, and they're all having a good time. They're laughing. They're eating food. They're drinking wine. They're taking selfies with Jesus. I love this, Jesus. We love hanging out with you. And Jesus ruins the party. He's laughing with them. He's like, yeah, oh, this is such a good time. One of you are going to betray me. And just, like, kill the vibe, you know? And... Uh, and one by one, the Bible says that the disciples in Matthew chapter 26, they started saying, is it I, Lord? Peter, is it I, Lord? James, is it I, Lord? John, is it I, Lord? And then Judas, who has been a pretender for three years, Judas, who has been living this duplistic lifestyle his whole life, Judas, who has done really good at hiding his failures and his flaws, he says, is it me, teacher? Did you notice the difference? Every disciple, is it me, Lord? Is it me, Lord? Is it me, Lord? Is it me, Lord? Ju Judas says, is it me, teacher? He revealed how he saw Jesus. And he did not see Jesus as Lord or as king, but as a teacher. Yeah, you got some good stuff to say, but you're not God. How do you see Jesus? How do you see Jesus? Can I tell you, Jesus is not Sunday morning, and he's not a concept, and he's not a religion, and he's not an antiquated message. He is not a dead man who is in the grave. In fact, you can't even find his bones if you search for him. Jesus is alive. Jesus is the reigning champion of the world. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. When we see him right, that's when we start to live right. That's who Jesus is. But the question is not who is Jesus. The question is who is Jesus to you? Is, is Jesus our king or our concept? Is he Lord or is he rabbi, teacher? Is he, is he God or is he a goosebump? 
I know this is heavy, but I'm just letting you know that the conviction of the Holy Spirit never comes to make you feel ashamed. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is the hand of the Lord lovingly leading you out of a life of pretending and saying, I have designed you for so much more. Judas revealed to the world how he saw Jesus and he saw him as teacher. Every pretender, every pretender, here's the second thought I want to share with you. Every pretender is going to have a price tag. There's some things that I own that are for sale. Like right now, if you want to offer me $2,500 for my shoes, they are for sale after service. I'll preach the third experience without shoes. I'll do it. This jacket, if you want to pay me $500 for it, I got it for $40 at H&M, but it is for sale. There are things that I own that are for sale. There are things that I own that do not have price tags on them. My wedding ring is not for sale. I don't know who would want to buy it or why, but that would be weird, but it's not for sale. I've got a Bible that I write notes in every single morning that one day I'm going to give to my sons that's not for sale. There's, there's things that I own that I have sentimental value tied up in that are not for sale. There's no price tag on them. Judas not only had a price tag on his purpose, on his calling, but on his actual relationship with Jesus. And we see this in Matthew chapter 26. Judas has finally decided the time has come. I'm going to betray Jesus. And he walks into the room where the religious leaders were and he decides... This is the moment he walks in. He kind of awkwardly stumbles in. I imagine Judas's heart is beating fast. I imagine he's overwhelmed with conviction. I, mean, I imagine that his hands are sweating. I imagine that he's short of breath. I imagine that Judas is feeling the weight of the mistake that he's about to make. And, and, and then he, he walks into them and to the room and he's like, hey, um, hey, what will you pay me? What will you pay me? If I betray Jesus, and I don't know about you, but those words jump out on the page. I'm so moved by those words. What will you pay me? What was Judas revealing? He had a price tag. I can be bought. I can be purchased. What will you pay me? And, and, and they counted out. They, they, so we got 30 pieces of silver, which is about $200 in modern currency. Will you take the deal, Judas? And Judas takes $200, walks out on Jesus. He leads them to the place where Jesus was. He kisses, them, he kisses him on the cheek. They arrest Jesus. And Judas, under the weight of condemnation and shame, tragically ends up ending his own life. He throws the silver back at the place where he got it because he's so ashamed. Judas' price tag living costed him everything. Costed him everything. Is there something maybe deep down in your heart that looks at the world and says, what will you pay me? If the price is right, if the moment is right, if the promotion is right, if she's cute enough, if he's got enough money, maybe, just maybe, when the enemy offers me 30 pieces of silver, I'll take the bait, I'll take the deal. What will you pay me? Pretending and price tag living. See, Samson had a price tag on his hair called Delilah. David had a price tag on his heart, which was designed to be a heart after God called Bathsheba. The rich young ruler had a price tag on his life called great possessions. All throughout history, the enemy has been swindling people into putting price tags on things that are infinitely valuable. And I'm here to remind you the verse that we shared at the very beginning of this message. You're not your own. You were bought at a price. You are bought at a price. You're bought at a price and you'll never live for sale when you realize that you have been bought. Maybe you're here today and you're like, man, you have spent the last 30 minutes effectively communicating to me that I am just like Judas. Thank you, pastor. So encouraging. And if I'm just like Judas, 
Is my end going to be like Judas's end? Am I going to walk out on Jesus one day? If I'm just like Judas, how does Jesus feel about me? And that's the question that I want to answer for the next five minutes. How does Jesus feel about Judas? The scripture answers that. See, right after Jesus was betrayed by Judas, they went to the Last Supper, and we talked about the Last Supper, but there was a moment at the Last Supper that I didn't mention, and that was that Jesus said, before we go, I want to wash all of your feet, all 12 of you. And so there was a moment where Jesus knelt down in front of Judas, who had 30 pieces of silver, which represented the suffering he was about to endure, in his pocket. And Jesus knew it. Jesus was looking into his eyes knowing, this is the reason why I'm about to endure this pain. And Jesus said, I'm still going to serve you. When Judas went to kiss Jesus on the cheek, Jesus' response was, why are you here, friend? Friend. Even in the midst of Judas's greatest mistake, even in the midst of Judas's greatest problem, arguably the most horrific sin in all of humanity, Jesus was looking Judas in the eyes and saying, I am head over heels in love with you. Oh, what great love, what great mercy to look at a betrayer, to look at a pretender, to look at one with price tags all over him and say, I'm crazy about you. I wish I could have preached to Judas before he got to the silver. I wish I could have looked Judas in the eye before he got to the rope and ended his own life. Because if I could have, I would have told Judas, hey, listen, God so loves the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall have everlasting life. Come on, I would have told Judas that mercy triumphs over judgment. I would have told Judas that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. I would have told Judas that death, nor life, nor angels, nor powers, present things, nor things in the future, height, nor depth, nor any created thing could ever, ever, ever separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I can't tell Judas, but I get to tell you today, there's no end to the love of Jesus. There's no end to the mercy of Jesus. And I don't know what pretending you have going on in your life. And I don't know what cycles you have going on in your life, but here's what I know the kindness of God leads us under repentance. And Jesus is head over heels in love with you right now. Do you know what the cross accomplished? Let me just ask you a question. How many of you believe that God will one day flood the earth again? Let me see your hand. No, God's not going to flood the earth again. Why do we believe that? Because he gave us the rainbow, right? I'm not going to do that again. Do you know Isaiah 54 shares this scripture? He says, this is like the floods of Noah to me. In the same way I've sworn I'll never flood the earth, so have I sworn I will never be angry with you or rebuke you. So if he's not going to flood the earth again, he's not mad at me. Maybe you've heard it said like this before. God's not mad at you. He's madly in love with you. I don't know what mistake you've made. Come on, are you thankful for the gospel? I don't know what, what sin you're tied up in. But just like Judas, Jesus was head over heels in love with him. And he's crazy about you. And here's the end of the message. Here's the response. We're receiving the love of God. He's going to rip the price tags off of our life. Today, the challenge is simple. It's just to say yes to Jesus again. If you grew up in church, maybe you remember that song, I'm trading my sorrows. And then the chorus was really, really creative. It said, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. It's creative songwriting. Here's what I love about that song. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, 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 Lord. There's no question asked in the song. So the yes is said before the question is asked. And that's what people who are not for sale do. Before you even ask me the question, Jesus, my answer is yes. 
Come on, before you even ask, my answer is yes. I don't know what it's going to be, but my answer is yes. If it, if it means preaching the gospel in my workplace, my answer is yes. If it means leading my family well, my answer is yes. If it means I make a lot of money, yes. If it means I'm poor, yes. If it means I'm a missionary in, in Africa, the answer is yes. If it means I reach my sphere of influence, the answer is yes. Come on, if it means I die on the same cross that you died on, I don't know what the question is, but my life is laid down down for this beautiful man named Jesus stand to your feet all across this room see if we see him rightly we're gonna live rightly